I, I really started thinking and being just hypersensitive around what and how it was creating. And it turned from really just wanting to create cool art, you know, into really using my artistic powers and gifts to um, tell stories, you know, and it, it, it just, it happened very organically, um, just really sitting again, having the opportunity to sit and specifically sit in my basement and just paint and just paint and just paint with stuff that was coming to me. A lot of the portraits were around, you know, Shamani or just, you know, how I was feeling or just really creating art about um, the people who came into my life during that time period. But, um, and it really helped me, it really helped me cope because I had an opportunity to put my emotions, physically put them somewhere, you know, and, and really had an, another opportunity to I understand that my emotional bandwidth, it was changing, you know, and learning how to feel all these different things. Um, once I had an opportunity and started to really do that, um, I got a just download from Shimani. She said, create another picture of me. And so I created another picture of her. And then um, I told her story of who she was as a as a woman, you know, and who we really lost, you know, and she wasn't out as she was not a statistic. She was not a number. She was a multitude of all these layers. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Holistic OBGYN Podcast. I'm Nathan Riley, your host. I am the manager, founder, whatever you want to call it, of Beloved Holistics, where I do functional women's health. I host some conferences through a program that Sarah Rosser and I developed called the Born Free Method. And um, I do home birth. I do all those types of things. And I have this podcast, which is my passion project that lets me have interesting conversations with important people that have unique gifts to share with the world. And I've got two guests today. And man, are they special. Omari Maynard and Shawnee Benton Gibson are here today. So we have a three-way conversation. And the link that binds these two together is that they both loved a woman named Shamani, who died shortly after having given birth to her second child, Omari's child. So Shamani was Omari's partner, and Shamani's mother was Sh Shawnee, the other guest I have today here in the studio. These um, individuals were featured in a film called Aftershock, which was really, it's on Hulu. It's a documentary around the ripple effect that follows the death of a woman, in this case Shamani, who was not very well cared for by the medical system at large. And how do we, as a community, pick up those pieces? But more importantly, how can we learn from these catastrophic events, which are not just data points. These are real people with real families and real children who are surviving them in their legacy. Well, obviously, the aftershock for my guest today, both Omari and Shani, was tremendous. And they have... Um, Shamani's, the essence of Shamani lives through their work. They're the co-founders of the Araya Foundation. And um, Shawnee is a clinical therapist. Um, they're both artists. And um, Shawnee uses a variety of modalities, acting out um, past events, um, improvisation, these types of things in order to help women develop leadership roles and breaking through out of cycles of trauma and breaking out of old narratives and telling new stories about themselves. And so um, Shani is also the co-founder of a program called the Spirit of a Woman Leadership Development Institute. We're going to link everything here in the podcast description. But furthermore, Shani and Omari are also coming out to the 2024 Born Free Twins Reach Conference. They're going to be speaking to some of the themes in Aftershock, this film. We're going to screen the film, and then they're going to be moderated by um, our lovely MCs, Savannah Brown and Hayes Hawk. 
in a conversation around um, this this notion of safety or lack thereof that um, many women, especially black women and women of color, face when they go into the hospital system. And the reason it's important that we talk about this is that just like, you know, people not being willing to recognize that maybe they're the doctors doing the unnecessary C-sections, most people wouldn't identify themselves as a racist, right? They might call themselves a white supremacist, but they would never say they're racist. They're just on a different team or whatever. I don't know. Um, I think it's important that we unpack, like, what is racism and how is it threaded into the very fabric of not just our society, but, but really specifically our medical system? where black women giving birth have a right to feel a little apprehensive about being in the hospital because they're more likely to die than their non-black counterparts. So we get into this. We get into fatherhood and Omari's incredible role as a dad now without his loving partner. Um, we get into, you know, what is it like for a black woman like Shawnee to go to the doctor's office when she was younger and how has she worked through that in her life into her, I think she's in her 50s now. Um, how do... How did she make it through life? How did she help to retell the story and to, to feel safe in the world again? This is important. The, the program that I have with Sarah Rosser, this Born Free program, it's called Born Free for a reason. And not, I don't think anybody would disagree that if we're not all free, then none of us are free. So even though you may not consider yourself racist, and I'm not telling you go home and whip yourself because you're debt racist, what comes through this conversation is we are all a part of one collective. And you have little bits of black persons and indigenous persons and South American persons and Far East Asian persons. You're all a part of the same amorphous human essence, right? And, and we can't see ourselves as divorced from this collective societal thing that we call the world. And so when we can start to reframe our role and we can start to be you know, open-hearted and open-minded, it allows us to build a new story together. And that's really what the work of both Amari and Shawnee is all about. So this is a really lovely conversation. Of course, if you want to come out and meet them in person, we're going to be doing some really fun things with Shawnee and Omari, like a collective art piece. Of course, we're going to have our panel discussion. Um, it's going to be a very intimate event out in, in Louisville. And by the time that you hear this, um, we may be full, but let me know if you want to be on the list. Sometimes we have last minute cancellations. Of course, all of the details, including the program itinerary, add-ons for you know simulator intensive workshops, are all going to be happening. Um, those will be happening on August 12th. But everything that you need to know about this event, which is not happening in 2025, this has been a really, really, really big project for me and my team. And so we're going to do it as, as perfectly as we possibly can. And you don't want to miss this. So bornfreetwinsbreach.com is where you can get all the information, including registration. There is a live stream option, which of course will not fill up. Um, you won't get the hands-on practice, but you'll get to hear um, from all of these incredible speakers. You'll get to really, really be a part of this. And um, and we're going to make it rich for you in special ways. So um, bornfreetwinsbreach.com. The film is called Aftershock. The links to the variety of incredible foundations and organizations um, that were created and are managed and operated by Omari and Shani, my guests today, will all be linked in the podcast description. In the show notes, belovedholistics.com slash podcast is where you can find that. If anything from this conversation or any conversation on the podcast, guys, reaches you like in here in your heart, right, or up in your brain, something here is important. Share with your friends. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, this is my passion project. This is what I do in order to learn more from interesting people who have such unique gifts. And I am very, very grateful to be able to do this for you. And I really wanna invite you into this conversation and every conversation with an open mind, open heart, put your biases at the door and just and just receive. There's, there's, no, there's no conflict here. This is really a, a matter of moving forward while acknowledging the past and acknowledging the present, but trying to build a better future for ourselves, for our families, for our kids, for their kids. We can do this, we can do this. 
I do have a, a little bit of sponsorship support that I'd love to tell you about to keep the lights on here. Doesn't offset the cost completely, but it certainly helps to have both Weenatal and Immune Intel AHCC as um, sponsors who help to uh, to get our production team going and to make sure that we've got beautiful reels on Instagram and we've got the YouTube channel up and running. And and so let me tell you a little bit about them. Weenatal makes my preferred prenatal vitamin. Um, you can go to the store and look at every single bottle. You're not going to find something quite like Weenatal. And they're also very, very conscious around their packaging materials, which I love. Go to weenatal.com slash beloved, subscribe monthly. If you have a glimmer in your eyes that you want to have kids or even postpartum or currently pregnant, this is the best prenatal on the market. It's also endorsed by Mark Hyman, who's a, the functional medicine guru, got a great podcast as well. I've got all of my clients, all of my born free community members, everybody's taking weenatal because it's the best. It's just that simple. Um, Instead of taking 10 capsules a day, you're going to take three capsules. It's loaded with everything you want, methylfolate, choline, vitamin D, you name it. It's got it in there. It's packed in. You don't have to take 10 capsules a day or you know, go, go broke in trying to get this incredibly important insurance policy on top of an already healthy lifestyle. But then when you subscribe, they're sending you sleeves, pack, you know, pouches with more, more, more pills without all of the you know, other wasteful packaging um, which I really, really love. I think we need to, you know, appreciate just how um, impactful we are on the planet with all of these these boxes that we get from Amazon and everything else. They'll also send you a mind body journal, which of course is a part of truly holistic care in maternity, in maternity space. So weenatal.com slash beloved. And you're, if you're wondering if there's a special perk for listeners, of course there is. We don't do a discount. I don't make commissions off of this. When you go there and you add a his or her or both, I recommend you both take prenatals to your cart and then add the fish oil. We needles fish oil. It's called Omega DHA Plus. Add that to your cart. And when you go to check out, the Omega um, DHA Plus will be shipped to you at no charge. That's a little special perk for being a supporter and listener of the podcast. My other sponsor is Immune Intel AHCC. That stands for Active Hexose Correlated Compound. This is a supplement made from the mycelia of shiitake mushrooms. And functional mushrooms are all the rage, but normally you're talking about the fruiting bodies. What about the mycelia? The mycelia are the, inter the original internet underneath every little bit of soil across planet Earth. In every dimension, in every little corner, you're going to find mycelia. It connects everything in our ecosystem. And we can become connected as well. If we go outside, get our feet in the dirt, get our, 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 some dirt under our fingernails, get some sunshine, sit and just be in nature once in a while. And that is actually therapy um, probably way beyond what the pharmaceutical companies and device manufacturers can offer you. But then if, when you consume functional mushrooms, it does a myriad of things in the body. Remember, these are not plants. These are not animals. These are not protozoa. This is the separate kingdom in and of itself, kingdom fungi. And from reishi to shaga to... Um, shiitake, these are all going to provide different benefits to your body. And this one, the mycelia of shiitake mushrooms, will boost the number of NK cells and T cells as a, in a way of immuno, uh, of a modulating your immune system in order to not only get a better immune response, better healing response, fight off infection, that type of thing, but also clear precancerous cells, which is why I'm using this supplement with such incredible uh, profound benefits to so many of my clients um, who have persistent HPV swabs at their gynecologist's office. They have over abnormal pap smears. This supplement is almost in and of itself your ticket to a clean bill of health at your gynecologist's appointment. But if you can then incorporate a whole bunch of lifestyle modification, just like with pregnancy, that prenatal is insurance for a healthy lifestyle. The Immune Intel HCC is an insurance policy on top of an already healthy lifestyle. You're never going to have to get a painful biopsy again. You're never going to end up with a leap or a cold knife cone because you're healthy. And when you're healthy and your immune system is working optimally, you don't have to worry about all this other stuff. Um, so I provide a bottle of this to the program I co-created with Mimi Linquist, Clear and Free. You can find more information about that program, which is your lifestyle program. You get lifetime access to me as you would with the Born Free Method, bornfreemethod.com. Um, you text or call with any questions, anything your doctor is telling you, you, just run it by me. We'll talk it over. I'll give you my best insights. Um, when you enroll in that program, you get a bottle of this because it works so well on this pesky HPV and cervical um, cancer screening dilemma. So go to themedicine.com. That's T-H-E-M-E-D-I-C-I-N.com. Find Immune Intel HCC. Add it to your cart and use code BELOVED10 and you'll save 10%.
off of a bottle. Or heck, if you're dealing with this, I recommend two to four capsules twice a day for about three months. Get a whole bunch of bottles. Save on the shipping. Um, again, I don't make a commission from this. I, this. These are products that I'm really, really, really determined to get to as many people as possible because they really work. And that's why I don't have 15 different sponsors. So thank you, Weenadal. Thank you, Immune Intel, AHCC. Um, I hope you guys will go and check them out and let them know that you're listening to the Holistic OBGYN podcast. All right. This is a really heavy but very beautiful conversation. I just can't wait to share um, with you, Shawnee Benton Gibson and Omari Maynard. Um, and I hope that you'll come out to Louisville August 8th through the 11th to meet them in person, support their work, and to start being a part of the revolution of changing maternity care for all people so all babies can be born free of manipulation and coercion and um, iatrogenic harm. And, um, and most importantly, that we can start to listen to women and help women feel safe in our care because that is there's this growing distrust and i understand it i see it as an unbiased third-party bystander more than i'd like and um fortunately we have people like um shawnee and omari here who are um just so willing to converse about some of these really sensitive things so enjoy my conversation with omari maynard and shawnee benton gibson <music> All right, I'm here with two guests. This is a pretty unusual sort of set of circumstances for me, but we're gonna, I had to bring you both on at the same time because you're both coming to the Born Free Twins Breach Conference. You were both featured in this film that I hadn't seen until Shawnee and I met. We had to go all the way to South Africa for me to hear about Aftershock. Um, but then of course I watched and I was like, holy smokes, from the standpoint of gathering 150 conscious birth workers together, we have to screen the film I got to get you both there. And we're going to make it work out. And of course, as a prelude to that, I wanted to be able to have an honest conversation with both of you about your experience, which of course is elaborated quite deeply in the film Aftershock around the loss of Shimani. So before we do that, um, Omari, why don't you just tell everybody briefly what you do and about your dope-ass art? Uh, thank you. Uh, so my name is Omari Maynard. I am the co-founder of the ARIA Foundation. ARIA stands for the Advancement of Reproductive Innovation through Artistry and Healing. I am the son of Elton and Dolores. I'm the father of Kari, Anari, and Uriah. Um, and I create art. I create dope-ass art. You know, dope <laughs> art um, so my what I do, and we can have time to talk about this, but like, after Shimani passed and, you know, because she was an artist in her own right, you know, so after she passed, I started really being very conscious and hypersensitive about what I'm creating and how I'm creating it, you know, and the things I want to depict, you know, so my art really speaks to um, just my emotional journey, you know, people who I've been in, able to interact with and being able to use art as a conduit to create further conversations around maternal health, maternal mortality, maternal excuse me, maternal morbidity, infant mortality, infant morbidity, fatherhood, you know, trauma, grief, all the things that we all end up going through some in some way, shape, form or fashion, just being human beings and living yeah. this life. Yeah. Well, since Shamani was um, your partner at the time, do you want to just, just quickly kind of give an overview of, of what happened? Of course, of course. So Shamani... Uh, uh, Shamani and I, we had our first child. We had a Nari in 2016, February 2016. And, you know, I was good with one, but she was not. And, you know, we ended up having another baby, Kari, on uh, September 23rd, uh, 2019. And, you know, I was good with two and she was not, you know. So um, she was having conversations with, uh, with Shawnee about, like, days after we got out the hospital about our third child and what we were going to do and how we were going to do it. Um, you know, but unfortunately when we got home, she was starting to have chest pains and heart palpitations, you know, shortness of breath. And because of the work that Shawnee's done and the work that, you know, she's pretty much brought us into in terms of the maternal health space and being in this space for, for years prior, um, you know, we, we figured Shamani might have a, um, a blood clot, you know, 
And so we got in contact with the hospital. We had personal relationships, you know, with where the care facility that we were at. And, um, you know, the advice that we was were given was for her to just rest and relax. And she was probably doing too much, mm. you know, um, unfortunately, because again, the fact that, you know, we knew the signs and symptoms and it and ended up being a blood clot, that blood clot ended up moving and she coded 13 days later, you know, in our house. Um, you know, I just thankfully, again, you know, in that whole process, the fact that, you know, Shimani's mom was here, Shawnee was with us, Shimani's aunt, Shimani's god sister was there on that day, you know, was really provided uh, some silver lining, um, some balance, some, 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 um, some rest, not even rest, but um, what's the word I'm looking for? Some support, some support and a very traumatic you know, life changing yeah. situation, you know, and unfortunately she passed away about 12 hours later. Um, and then since then, you know, Shawnee and I and our family have been on, you know, this continuous crusade to make sure that Shimani's death does not go in vain, to make sure that people know who Shimani is and what great person she was, but also to, to, you know, outside of even Shimani, because it's bigger than us and it's bigger than her as well, to make sure that, you know, we really create this space in, um, you know, helping and and informing people about what's going on in America in terms of the maternal mortality and morbidity epidemic and child mortality yeah. and child morbidity epidemic, you know, and, and really tr making sure that we create space to shift culture and how we think about birthing in America. Yeah, gosh. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope people can appreciate just how um, sensitive this conversation is going to be. I mean, we're talking about one of the more catastrophic things that can happen to any family and to any child and to any woman. So, uh, Omari, I'm really, really happy to know you and grateful that you're here. Um, and thank you for sharing a little snippet. Of course, I mentioned the film, but Aftershock is really a do it's a great documentary that really it, it doesn't talk really just about Shimani. It, it really more importantly talks about the aftershock of what happens when we're neglectful of, of or, or just simply not listening. When, it, when a person is having these symptoms, we need to really take this seriously. And we'll get into maybe the difference in what the type of care Shimani you know, received compared to maybe somebody else. But um, I'd love to hear from Shawnee as well. Shawnee, Shimani was your daughter. So, um, First, maybe just give people a brief introduction as to who you are and what you're doing now in sort of the legacy of, of Shamani. Yes. So greetings to, to all that are viewing this. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be on this platform and to strengthen our connection as colleagues and as friends and as stakeholders in this conversation about reproductive justice and reproductive health and birth equity and all the things that are connected, just living life and making sure that we all have access um, to quality of life and quality of care. Um, so as you shared, I am Shani um, Renee Benton Gibson. I am the CEO of Spirit of a Woman Leadership Development Institute and the co-founder of the ARIA Foundation. And Omari, I don't think he mentioned this, but ARIA stands for the Advancement of Reproductive Innovation through Artistry and Healing. So um, by training um, and formal education, I am a social worker and psychotherapist. I'm a licensed clinician. I've been in the field of social services for over 33 years. Um, I've served in child welfare. I've served in substance abuse and mental health. Um, I've um, been in a lot of spaces and places where I have gotten an opportunity to serve my people, people who look like me, black and, um, and brown folk, um, a lot of women. I have a company called Spirit of a Woman. Um, and so the conversation about birthing has always been present. Um, sadly, I was part of a system that um, women, women of color would give birth and their babies would be taken right after. They would do something called bag the urine. Um, they would check the urine of the mom or the baby, I'm sorry, the baby, and then um, check for substances. And if they found any traces of substances, they would immediately criminalize and weaponize that. And rather than offer care and support, they would take the baby away. And depending on the circumstances, they would um, file criminal charges. And there were a lot of layers to that system that did not serve folks who look like me. And I was part of that system. But luckily, I was part of the system where I would train and develop people who had their children taken away to 
um, stand for themselves, to learn about their rights, um, to fight for those rights. And I was part of shifting the system. And I'm so grateful. Um, didn't know I was, what I was fully doing at that time, but there was a bridge between this reproductive justice conversation and the child welfare um, conversation. And I was being prepared before I even knew it for such a time as this. Um, and Shimani and Jasmine, my two oldest children were present when I would do that work. So they've always, they were always involved with community, advocacy work, fighting for our rights. They knew about anti-racism and anti-oppression. They knew about patriarchy and capitalism and all those things. We were part of a spiritual community um, that allowed for us to learn how to bring spirit and ceremony into those conversations. And so what I do today was um, fueled and um, a foundation, a solid foundation was built for what I do now. Um, I'm sorry, back then for what I do now. And so when I hear Omari talk about um, just what my knowledge provided and then also post the aftershock of Shamani's death, what it still provides and what he provides for me, like I could not have healed as powerfully if he, um, my extended family members, my other children, um, like if they weren't around holding space and if they weren't clear about the need for us to do something meaningful around the experience and share with community on a, um, a larger scale while we grieved. And I think that combination, that formula su still supports me in being able to process that I lost my child, that she's never coming back, but we get an opportunity to create a legacy in her memory and then also to serve our community mightily from our grief and then also from the powerful gifts that we have. So I'm really, really grateful that we get to share these gifts with your listening and viewing audience. Yeah. Man, I've got like, <laughs> I've got so many questions. Um, before we get into the maternity care system, um, I want to bring up a couple of things. Uh, the, the first really, the, the only thing I really want to bring up right now is something that Sh Shawnee, you had shared with me when you and I were sitting at the table, we had just met in um, Johannesburg at this beautiful hotel. We were there um, under the, the care of Restore Forward, Savannah Brown, a mutual friend of ours, um, her organization. And we were um, going to be setting out into some of the villages outside of Johannesburg. And you and I just started chatting. Um, of course, I've said this before, and I, I recently interviewed Machila Motse, our guide there, PhD, Dr. Motse now, and, um, and uh, brought up with her. I said, you know, what was it like to, to know that there was like this white OBGYN coming from the States that's going to be in your space? And she was like, I, it was necessary to have you there. Um, not because uh, I was like the missing piece, but because I needed to be a part of the collective healing that we were all doing around some of the things that are even going to come up today in the modern day Western medical model of maternity care. But in that conversation, you had said something to me. You said that one of the most common things people had said to you when you were on tour showing this film was sort of an implication that you were now taking care of the children. And so, Amari, I'm going to give you an opportunity as well. What the hell? Like, <laughs> like, why is that the first thing out of people's mouths? And Amari, a lot of this is going to weigh on you, but how did mm -hmm. it make you feel, Shawnee, um, as a black woman? And Omari, of course, you as a black man, how did it make you feel for that sort of presumption to be the first thing out of your out of somebody's mouth? Yeah. Um, sadly, I wasn't shocked. Um, just thinking about how the narrative um, that is associated with black men and black men who parent, um, who father children, like how they're viewed and how they're spoken about and how there's this belief that they're not present. And if they're present, they're doing harm and doing damage. And if black mothers aren't present to parent and hold space for their children, then the automatic is that there's another black woman in her clan that's going to step in and take over and the father will be on the periphery. Um, that was never a thought in my mind. Um, Omari and Shimani co-created those children. Omari and Shimani responsible and accountable for the children. And I have my level of accountability in my role and will always have that level of account accountability. But it never crossed my mind mm. that, oh, Shimani's gone. So let me take these children or even broach that subject matter with Omari. It was about how do we support him and being able to continue parenting his children. And Omari's an amazing and very present dad. And even if he wasn't, my automatic wouldn't be like, let me 
um, take away um, something else from him while he's grieving. We would have figured it out, you know, because we are um, a, a, a family that's all about solutions and covering and, you know, and I'm a person that confronts or care fronts things. So if there was an issue, it would be addressed. So I was saddened um, that they folks had that in their minds. It's like, oh, you have the children? I'm like, what are y'all talking about? But I'm glad it was brought up because we get an opportunity to um, dispel those myths and to create, not even create a narrative, it's an already existing narrative about Black men being present. And Omari will probably speak about the research that has been done around that. But I'll say really quickly, and Omari, I don't know if you're aware of this, but um, I've officiated um, unions. I've, I'm a, a spiritual leader, so I've designed baby showers and you know gatherings around naming of children and all those things that are ritualized in our community. And 20 plus years ago, I included men in those gatherings. And it's just new that men are part of it. But I'm like, that's always been my mindset. To me, it would be weird not to have the person who's on the other side of this creation not be present to celebrate, to lift up, to affirm, to give guidance and support to because babies don't get created in the absence of men and their contribution, whether they're engaged in high vibrational relationships with the person who's the womb holder or not, like men are part of it. So to me, it's a very, very disrespectful, um, um, harm um, igniting dynamic to have folks thinking that men aren't showing up for their children, no matter what the circumstances are. Yeah. Omari, what would you like to contribute? Uh, this is one of those sensitive topics, but I, I feel like we're all, um, I feel like we're in a, in a safe place to really talk this through so that somebody out there who says, well, I'm not racist, but then they say something that sort of implies some sort of bias against black men or black women or whatever else. Um, and, and by the way, the time that this episode is released is a couple of days after Father's Day. So Amari, nice. from, from father to father, happy Father's Day. Thank you. Same, same to you, brother. <laughs> same to you. Um, I, so to answer your question, you know, it just speaks to the power of like marketing and propaganda, honestly, you know, and, and what we choose to believe, even though we choose to believe the things that are marketed to us as opposed to what we're seeing, you know, um, you know, so the CDC, it, it states that black, black and brown men are the most active in their, in their children's lives, regardless of whether they custodial Whoa. parents, whether they're in the household or not. You know, they're taking the kids to school, they're doing the homework, they're changing the diapers, they're feeding, they're, they're doing all the things that, you know, um, are needed, you know, in terms of parenting and, and being supportive of their children. Um, and, and again, you know, like I said, this is more than any other race, you know, but um, obviously, you know, what we see and what we intake on TV and 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 here in music and things of that nature, um, it says the opposite, but... Um, my thing is honestly even after shamani passed like it was never a thought like oh what am i going to do with the kids i can't handle this you know uh, uh, they're my children you know <laughs> like yeah. they're my children yeah. and you know like they are they just lost their mother you know so like the thought was never oh like let's you know extend them further from their father or i, I need space like there wasn't a thing but so I need space. Let's talk about that, right? So that was a thing, though. I did need space. I did need time to heal. I did need time to process. I did need time to grieve um, and think through and shift because, you know, my life changed. You know, the goal, the plan, you know, all the plans, short, mid, long-term plans were all included Shimani, right? Um, and then those plans did not. Um, so... I needed Shawnee, I needed Jasmine, and I needed um, Jaya, or, or every, so I'm trying, so Shamani's brother, Shamani's sister, Shamani's mom, Shamani's aunts, uncles, my family, everybody, the community, to come and help and, and help and figure out um, how we were going to support. Not this wasn't necessarily a full-on conversation, of course, with the collective, but 
um, within our family unit, you know, we got together and we figured things out, you know, and it allowed me space again to process. And I'm just, again, so grateful, so thankful for that because of the fact that, you know, as I go out into the world and talk about fatherhood and, you know, paternal issues and maternal mortality and things of that nature and having the opportunities to speak to dads who've lost their partners or have suffered, have had lost their children, um, or suffered morbidities in between either or, um, they don't have that same support, you know, they don't have that same galvanizing of community. Like I didn't have diapers for almost a year and some change, you know, uh, I had food vouchers for months, you know, I had um, people calling and checking up on me, you know, for a long time, you know, and, and those are the things that allowed me again to really just sit and figure out my next steps. And again, a lot of people don't have that opportunity. They got to get right back to it, you know, as soon as the repass is over and everybody and the the um, car crash has been passed, you know, and people are just on the road and, and they're back to their regular yeah. life. But yeah. thankfully, that was not my story, you know. So, again, I'm just thank you, Shawnee. Thank you, everybody, you know, for, for being there in support of, of me and my children, because I definitely yeah. needed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I will say it's ever since I met Shawnee and Shawnee, you're you're a um, I don't know if I've ever met anybody quite like you. You 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 are like elegant, intelligent, graceful, beautiful, and you don't take shit all at the same time. Like you're just this really, uh, really uh, profoundly interesting and important human. And um, when I've told your guys' story, you know, I've recommended Aftershock and whatnot, kind of reflecting on this, a lot of people would say something like, and I've, I heard this verbatim, Omari, wow, he's a super dad. And it, this is from white people, right? Um, so what I think it really reflects is that, unfortunately, it is a surprise to, uh, to everybody especially, I guess, black men, because of the way that propaganda, as you mentioned, has sort of infiltrated our subconscious. But like, no, Amari is not a super dad. Yes, you are a super dad, but he's not a super dad. He's a dad. He's like doing what a dad would do, right? It's, it's really kind of a challenging thing, I think, for a lot of people's subconscious. So thank you for sharing that. Um, no I want to, um, yeah, I, I, I want to shift now to the sort of maternity care system at large. And um, Omari, since you're kind of front and center right now, was there any point in the birth of either of your children where you felt like I'm being discriminated against, even if it was something really subtle? And how is that a part, sort of a, a deeply important part of what ultimately happened to Shamani? Um, yeah, so... You know, when we had, when we were going through the birth of our daughter of Anari, Shimani and I, we decided to have a midwife and a doula, you know, because of, we just knew, you know, we knew about what the importance of having a midwife and doula was. We knew the importance of having the support, um, you know, and that was what we chose to do. So, you know, just going through that process the first time, um, we ended up having a and, you know, just having a hospital birth as well. And that was the plan, you know. So um, after we had our, after we gave birth to um, Anari and she had ended up having to get a C-section with Anari as well, um, I think mainly because of the fact that it was just not necessarily a comfortable situation for her. Um, one particular instance was we, when we had the, when we had Anari, Anari came out safely. Uh, she was uh, seven, eight pounds. You know, she was a healthy child. She ended up having to go to NICU because they said that they claimed she had sundowning. Um, and it was something that, again, I didn't know of at the time. I didn't really know what the term was or what it meant. Um, what I did know is that she she was healthy. She looked fine, um, but they wanted to put her in there and they didn't allow uh, Shimani space and to give her... Um, um, the um, colostrum, you know, mm. and get and allow space for her to really be able to bond with Anari, you know, as soon as she came out the womb. And then also, 
um, they ended up keeping our placenta, saying that they, you know, needed to run tests on it and things of that nature. Um, I bring all of that to say, like, a couple of weeks later, they try to give us the placenta back and say, oh, we don't need it anymore. You know, and at that point, it was, you know, we couldn't really do anything with it. Um, and, and all of that, you know, I, there were questions that I had that were not necessarily being answered. There were things that I was feeling that they didn't have um, anybody within the maternal care system to address these issues, mm -hmm. personal issues for me. Um, and then, you know, more than anything, you know, we didn't get solid answers to the questions that we had to the things that they were just doing and using fear tactics as a, as the instrument in order to do so. Um, so yeah, that was, I mean, that was prevalent and we did not want to go through that again at all. So we decided to have a home birth with Kari, you know, so that we could like circumvent all of that and, and, and control mm -hmm. the environment. Um, and unfortunately, uh, after Shimani's, we ended up actually changing midwives and doulas as well, you know, but with Kari after Shimani's water broke, um, yeah, it was this, it, and you know, systemic racism is a beast. You know, it's everywhere. It is all over, and it is in all things. You know, so we um, ended up again trying to have a at home birth. It didn't necessarily work out because of she wasn't dilating as fast as she needed to. You know, and this was coming from our our midwife who was. Unfortunately, one of the only black midwifery services in Brooklyn, you know, so she was overworked and overwhelmed as well. Um, didn't really feel like we got the care that we needed from her. Went to the hospital. Um, and again, fast forward, you know, they did what they needed to do, but um, they ended up taking out Shimani's fibroids um, while, you know, after they took uh, Kari out. Um, there was via C-section. And then I found out later that's a whole separate, another other procedure that cannot happen at the same time. And I think, honestly, that yeah. was the beginning of her demise. You know, she was open for way too long. You know, so these are like microaggressions on top of macroaggressions, on top of systemic racism, on top of over usage and underservice, you know, communities. Like, it's a lot of things that all... Um, you know, equated to her unfortunate passing. Um, and of course, hindsight is 2020, but it's important yeah. that we have these conversations so that people know, know what's really going on. And it's not just them, you know, going through these things. Yeah. I'm, thank you, uh, Omari. Um, Shawnee, I'm going to go to you, but I, I want to share for those listening, I think you know, so we've got this really high C-section rate for for all comers in the United States. And there's not a single doctor out there that says, you know what, guys, sorry, my bad. I'm the one who's doing all the unnecessary C-sections. I think the same reality is true for racism, where people just presume that I'm not the racist. I love black people. I was very kind to that person. But I, I think these microaggressions is actually um, something that's hard for people to really uh, appreciate, you know, just how it makes a person feel. And there's a, I'm not going to say who they are because they, it, it would probably ruin my relationship with them, but somebody that is extremely close to me. No, it's not my wife. Um, somebody who's extremely close to me said, you know, when I was a nurse, I remember that it was hard to, you know, to, to give flu shots to, to black men and women because their skin was so thick. So there is this sort of uh, this sort of fabric of racism woven into the very thread of modern medical systems, particularly in the United in the United States, given our legacy. So, Shawnee, I want to ask you, sharing as a woman who has been to a gynecologist probably countless times, when a person says, "Hey, you should go see your doctor," does it give you any pause? Like, like when you when you reflect on how you feel. In, in a doctor's office, especially if it's somebody who looks like me, somebody who's who's white and probably hasn't lived your experience? Thank you for the question. Um, once again, I said earlier when you were sharing that you were going to ask me this, that I've never been asked this before, especially in this type of setting. So I appreciate this. I don't have concerns about going to a doctor in this, I'm 55, right? I say I'm 55 and in my stride 
Yes, I've been to the doctor many, many times over the course of my life, and I'm glad I'm able to declare that because not all of us do that for a variety of reasons. Um, and that includes white folks alike, right? However, um, I don't worry about that now because I have people that not only look like me, because that's not enough, that's part of the formula, but folks who have demonstrated mm. their deep listening their high regard for me, their, the co-creation that exists in our relationship. Um, they address me when I go to the doctor's office and ask how I'm doing. They know about Shimani. Um, in fact, where I go to the doctor, she was going to the doctor as well when she was alive. Um, so there's a familiarity there and a deep connection there so that I don't worry about what they're telling me. When they want to take tests, they ask my permission. When it's time to touch me or to have a pap smear or to have a breast exam, they ask for consent. Yeah. So I don't have those concerns. I'm very chill when I go to the doctor. My only concern is how long I'm going to be there, not who's going to be working with me while I'm there. And even if it's not my direct care provider because because it's a collective. I mean, I have my um, doctor, but if she's not there, I know I can see anybody there. Um, and a lot of folks don't have that privilege, you know, to be able to say that. Um, but in my younger years, before I was as conscious and aware of how these systems work, mm. I experienced a lot of mis maltreatment, um, folks being dismissive, not looking me in my eye, not knowing my name. Mm. You know, when I came to the doctor, utilizing facilities where there were a lot of folks who look like me in communities of color that are underserved and undervalued and disrespected. And so I've had that experience. One of the things that I had not thought about in a long time, um, and it was around giving birth to Shimani, you know, it was in Queens. I'm, I'm someone that lives in Queens and I'm born and raised in Queens. I've lived in Queens 50 of my 55 years. But I remember going to the hospital and Shimani came quickly Right. And my birthing, my labor experience, like I was real um, grounded and prepared for what was going to happen. I educated myself and I also spoke to a lot of people. I went to the hospital. My grandmother was like, oh, I'm going to drop you because it's your first child and I'll come back. And I had the baby at 944. I think she left at seven something. And I had the baby at 944 a.m. with nobody there with me because they all thought it was going to take a long time. And I remember getting and you'll correct me, Nathan, because sometimes I don't get the pronunciation sure. right. An episiotomy. You nailed it. Is that the right? Yeah, word? you nailed it. OK, so I had an episiotomy for no damn reason. I know that now the baby Shimani came out smooth. And so this man cut me and it was a young it's prob it was probably a resident because like I said retrospectively I know the language I was young I had it when I was 20 but I know when they say it in aftershock he that person needed to practice cutting and sewing and here I am I was 20 but I looked like I was 12 having this baby I was married but you know nobody was in there and they cut me and they sewed me back and I'm like there was no reason for that person to do mm. that and they didn't even they just did it you know, and I remember it. it. It's it's in my physical muscle memory. Like I can call forth the feeling of it when it was done. And so that's the stuff that's unworkable. The I, it's almost like they have ownership and dominion over black and brown bodies. If you're perceived to be poor, if you're young, if nobody is around to advocate for you, it's like this. It's a free for all, and I get to practice literally practice medicine on they use that terminology for a reason. And some folks doing, engaging in the medicine don't fully know what they're doing because it's like, you know, I know it theoretically, but doing it with a human being, it is a practice and you can do great damage, not just because of you, maybe you don't do the physical part of it wrong, but the humanistic part of it, folks get wrong a lot for a variety of reasons. And part of it is racism and paternalism and patriarchy and massage noir, which is the hate for black women or brown women. And so we it's a big problem and it's yeah. damaging and um, impacting the credibility of the system. Yeah, I, you know, it, I, thank you for that, um, Shawnee. I, I, um, I think it's very, very hard when we when we just go to the data. You know, the reason I'm asking you this personally as a friend is because I want to hear your ex your experience instead of trying to generalize a data set to you. But you know, the data collecting data it's really, really hard to do that because I even think the process of collecting data leads to there, there's some degree of of distrust there. And we're going to get into you know the legacy of the 
the previously known as father of gynecology, we all know who the mothers of gynecology are, and we'll elaborate on that a little bit. But um, even in the process of collecting data, I think that there's good reason for people of color, specifically black men and women, to have some degree of distrust as to how is this data going to be used? Is this, you know, uh, am I am I signing away something that I'm not like totally, you know, it's not not totally clear to me. So when we look at the data, and a lot of people like to bring big studies up and all of that. I do think it's it's really, really relevant when you look at the data around um, a lot of people say, well, it's an education thing or whatever. But if you compare black, um, however they describe it, educated black women versus uneducated black women, they both have the same, almost the same perception of not being listened to, of being having their symptoms or their complaints dismissed. Um, and that just seeds this distrust further, which of course, there's a legacy of this, which we'll get into next. But before we move forward, um, I'd like for both of you to answer, what is one or two things that you think we could and maybe should do? I don't like coulds and shoulds, but we're going to use it. We could and should do in order to make sure that this doesn't happen to somebody else, you know, what happened to Shimani. Hey guys, it's Nathan. Wanted to uh, interrupt this amazing conversation very briefly to talk to you, um, specifically if you're a birth worker. Um, this goes for doulas, childbirth educators, midwives of all sorts, whether you're out of hospital or in hospital, and especially the OBGYNs, the family medicine docs, those of you who are attending to births. I want you to ask yourself, if a person rolls into your practice and they're in labor and there's a butt emerging from the vagina, what are you going to do? What I was taught to do was let's rush you to the operating room. Forget about informed consent. We have to do this through the abdomen. We have to do a C-section because the baby is breech. But frankly, I think a lot of women, rightfully so, want to avoid C-section, you know, unnecessarily, of course. And so if you were to just rely on your, let's say your OBGYN residency training, you're not going to have the skills to attend to a breech birth. The good news is most breech babies come out without any intervention at all. But in the rare chance that they have a nuchal arm or a hyperextended neck or whatever, you want to have those skills. And it requires practice on practice on practice to get those skills, which is why I started hosting an annual conference here in Louisville. And in 2024, we're going to be leveling up this entire program. This is the 2024 Born Free Twins Breach Conference, where you're going to be able to get plenty of simulator experience uh, with very, very well-trained educators and instructors. You're going to hear from a variety of midwives and some doctors. Um, this year, we're featuring the Spinning Babies team, Breach Without Borders team. Stu Fishbein's going to be there. Christine Laria is coming with the Breach Without Borders team. She was a recent addition. Um, Carol Gauchi from the Pacific Northwest is coming. Um, we're also bringing two keynote speakers, Machilo Motse, who's a new, newly crowned PhD from uh, South Africa, as well as Doña Angelina Martinez Miranda from Cuernavaca, Mexico is coming. These are instructors that have quite a bit, uh, a breadth of, uh, of knowledge and experience in order to help round out your own education. I haven't even mentioned um, Tracy Vogel, who's an OB anesthesiologist. She's going to be coming in to talk about trauma-informed care. Hermine Hayes Klein is coming to speak to informed consent. There is so much that we're offering here. And I've only gotten to the like didactics part. There's going to be plenty of time to practice on, on, on very realistic um, mannequins. And there are going to be some other activities for you to do some healing and as a means of community building. So we're going to do some trauma release work, um, a musical odyssey with Rebecca Kelly G. There's going to be some ecstatic dance in the mornings if you're uh, open to that. It can be very, very releasing because we've suppressed so much of this stuff throughout our lives that if we can't use our voice and our bodies in an expressive way, it's going to become a second chakra issue. It's going to, it's going to impact our reproductive organs and our overall health. Um, we're going to be screening... Um, uh, we're going to be screening Aftershock and having a panel discussion with Shawnee Benton Gibson and Omari Maynard, both of whom were featured in the film because um, Omari's wife, who is also Shawnee's daughter, she died as uh, a result of what I would call medical negligence um, due to the color of her skin in the medical system. And that's what Aftershock, the film, is all about. Um, 
we're going to do a breath work shop with Sarah Tremoli of Effigy Breath. There is just so much healthy food, healthy community, healthy mm -hmm. conversation in a very, very safe space. No breakout sessions. You're all going to be in the same room together in a very intimate setting, mm -hmm. which I think is very, very important for this work. If you're interested in coming, go to bornfreetwinsbreach.com. Um, register as early as you can because the price will will gradually increase as we get closer and closer to the event. There are a few opportunities available for work exchange for students or people who are otherwise unable to attend financial for financial reasons, um, but everything will be on site at the Omni Hotel in downtown Louisville, a beautiful hotel with some very, very beautiful meals and beautiful spaces that we're all going to be sharing together. I hope to see you in Louisville. The dates are August 8th through the 11th with an opportunity to do either NRP certification or a simulator intensive workshop with one of our instructors on the 12th if you want to stick around. And for those who stick around, maybe there'll be some other goodies along the way. Bornfreetwinsbreach.com. I hope to see you in Louisville. <music>
dehumanize us and dehumanize other people. So I would love for the medical community and the academic spaces that train and develop um, future doctors to be looking at all of those components and training from there. And then the other piece, I'll say this really quickly, we need to start talking about physical bodies and beingness and what our bodies can do and the possibility of getting pregnant or, you know, co-creating with someone much earlier than what we do, not just when someone gets pregnant. Now we have all these big conversations, but start talking about what our bodies can do in elementary school, yeah. you know, um, junior high school so or middle school, as they call it in some spaces, so that you can have knowledge and not be sideswiped by all of this stuff Absolutely. when you're grown and trying to prepare for a family. Absolutely. I mean, I think th- that seems like a tall order, but I, I think a lot of people, they they get a little too conservative with the types of changes we want to see. I, just, I feel like if we don't dream up the ideal, we're never even going to start moving in the right direction. And all of those things are relevant. Everything both of you said to my own medical training, uh, just very, very briefly, I trained, um, everybody can look up where I went to school, Temple University in, in uh, North Philadelphia. And they must have displaced 100 families to build a multi-million dollar medical school. And then we were there going around, you know, picking up garbage and people would be spitting at us. People would be, you know, very um, making it very, very understood that they're really, really unhappy with the fact that there's a big medical school that's mostly being attended to by uh, by white, you know, middle class kids like myself. And um, I remember I just didn't volunteer for any of the neighborhood cleanups because it was like, I'm just walking through this neighborhood trying to kind of greenwash the reality that these families have been living since this giant building was built. And um, and without really being able to appreciate their lived experience, how am I possibly going to see them in the emergency room across the street or whatever else? So, I mean, all of this is super relevant. I, I really appreciate you guys um, kind of honestly sharing that. I think that we need to hear this. I think we need to really start, like when we talk about integrating medical systems and communities, a hospital has the opportunity to do that. But we have to actually start um, first with a reconciliation of what we do and don't know. And I think that we're missing a lot of the sort of, uh, it's not just cultural, it's it's also kind of the humanity of what we're supposed to be doing in medicine. So, um, Speaking of humanity, I was a humanities student and I was a literature student and um, I was also a Spanish language and literature major. And um, I have a kind of a tender spot in me around the power of art and, and, and a variety of different therapeutic modalities in order to help families um, I don't want to say cope because that kind of diminishes it, but to to ride out the waves of the aftershock of really, really bad things happening, specifically in my field around the loss of a baby. Um, fortunately, you know, not a lot of women die in childbirth, but if that were to happen, that requires the entire community to circle, as Omari said, circle the wagons around this family, this this unit, in order to make sure that they're cared for. But you guys both are, are co-founders of uh, different organizations. And I want to highlight a little bit of some of the work you've done with the Araya Foundation. You guys have mentioned it, but this is, this is the advancement of reproductive innovation through artistry and healing. Um, how are you guys utilizing the arts in order to support some of these initiatives? And how has your art, specifically you, Amari, how has it changed ever since um, we said goodbye to Shamani? Um, yeah, most so uh, our foundation, and I'll talk about you know just visual arts right now. But we do a lot of we touch on all artistic modalities, and I'm sure Shawnee will be able to you know add add to all the other things that we do. But um, you know, for me, when Shamani Pat, well, when we when she was here, we had we created an organization called Art for Living. And Artful Living was, you know, essentially a way to use art, you know, and all things art to bring the community together. So we did, you know, sip and paints. We did paint parties. We did T-shirt making. Um, we did wood carving and glass etching, all types of speed dating, all types of stuff. Um, but at that time, it was really just let's just create. You know, we're just on just trying to create our own existence, you know, and using art as a way to do it. Uh, and, but after she passed, you know, my, you know, my, I, I really started thinking and being just hypersensitive around what and how it was creating. And it turned from really just wanting to create cool art, you know, into really using 
my artistic powers and gifts to um, tell stories, you know, and it, it, it just, it happened very organically, um, just really sitting again, having the opportunity to sit and specifically sit in my basement and just paint and just paint and just paint with stuff that was coming to me. A lot of the portraits were around, you know, Shamani or just, you know, how I was feeling or just really creating art about um, the people who came into my life during that time period. But, um, and it really helped me, it really helped me cope because I had an opportunity to put my emotions, physically put them somewhere, you know, and and really had another opportunity to I understand that my emotional bandwidth, it was changing, you know, and learning how to feel all these different things. Um, Once I had an opportunity and started to really do that, um, I got a just download from Shimani. She said, create another picture of me. And so I created another picture of her. And then um, I told her story of who she was as a as a woman, you know, and who we really lost, you know, and she wasn't out as she was not a statistic. She was not a number. She was a multitude of all these layers. Um, and that turned into me creating a portrait for uh, Bruce McIntyre of his partner, Amber, and telling her story. And then Charles Johnson creating a picture for Kiara Johnson and telling her story and, and letting people understand that, you know, these are pillars in their communities and their own rights. And that really s- kind of snowballed into me creating a series called In Her Honor, which was basically um gifting portraits to families who've lost their partners due to maternal mortality. Oh my Uh, gosh. You know, as a way to Ah. uh, one, build connections with them, real connections and not just, you know, I'm sorry for your loss connections, but you know, really sitting down, having an opportunity to talk to them, share my experience, have them, because a lot of these families don't feel comfortable talking about it. Don't have the space to even want to do it. You know, so doing it with somebody who they knew, went through the same thing was extremely important for them as well as for me, you know, but also too to give it, give them a chance to tell, you know, the tell about the lives of their loved one, you know, the music that she liked, how many kids she had, what she loved, what she loved to do as a child, what were her goals and aspirations, where she graduated, what was, how did she meet her partner? You know, these were all conversations that I would have with them. And it really um, allowed for bonds to be made and and built. Um, Because, and again, that's telling the story, right? That's how we need to really learn how to connect with people. Um, And then I would give, again, gift them that portrait, but then, you know, share their story on social media, you know, with um, the world. And, you know, that really kind of shifted how I started looking at myself as an artist and, you know, um, as an individual and really understanding, like, I'm a narrative strategist, you know, in terms of using my art, using talents, again, to tell stories of others and to bring communities closer because, Mm. again... You know, we don't really realize how connected we are and the experiences that we have until we actually share our stories. Man, you're, uh, I'm so excited to meet you in person, Omar. We'll talk about the conference that we've, we've got coming up. Um, Shawnee, of course, <laughs> thank you, Omar. Sean, I, I want to, you know, ask you a similar question, but if I could modify it just a little bit, I want to bring in something that I remember from our South Africa trip together. And that is that when we were all dancing in a group at one point, I remember um, one of the songs when it was translated to English was something about white people not being able to move their hips. And um, that was the, you know, it was, they were, they were playing, they were having fun. But then of course, me being one of the only white people, I had to go in there and, uh, and then reflect on, wow, it's, it's interesting how reserved, you know, I am and probably many of the people in my, my immediate surroundings here are around dancing. And I did some deep meditation on this. And, and Omar, you brought something up that 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 kind of um, brought this back to my attention. But I think it's um, collectively, uh, I think a lot of people in, you know, depending on your culture, have a hard time really feeling through anything. And in fact, it's something that we try to run away from because it's sometimes really painful to really sit with feelings, especially when something as catastrophic as losing your your partner or a child or your even your mother, father. Really, any there's some big losses we go through. It's a part of being human. But um, Shawnee, you're you're a clinical therapist, 
And so how do you use, how is, your art form is different, you know? Um, how do you use that to help people feel through this so that they don't end up with what we call complicated grief, but they actually can process this through um, therapy, through, through the arts? Sure, you know, just in thinking about that trip, um, when we went to, I don't know if it was Venda, I can't remember where we were, where the midwives there utilized um, the arts, um, dramatization and music. Yeah, I think that was Venda. To, um, yeah. Venda, yeah. Um, to demonstrate what can happen, whether it's a breech birth or um, things are going as they, they should and unfolding um, as spirit and um, the mother and her womb space and her ancestors would have it unfold. Um, I, it was deeply moving for me to be there because um, storytelling has always been a part of my life since I was a small child. I loved reading, like I was an avid reader and words have always been my wand. Um, and you can use a wand to make magic or you can use a wand to knock somebody over the head. And I use my wand in both ways, right? <laughs> and everything in between. Um, and so I would read books and then I would write new endings at the, um, you know, I'm like, I'm not done with the characters. So being a, a, an actor um, was in my destiny. Being someone who could um, utilize words for transformation was in my destiny. So through poetry, um, through playwriting, through, um, you know, I've started a few novels. I've, I'm an author of a book called Walk in the Light with Me, and it's about healing and transformation and me telling my story from birth to age 40 and just what I've been through as far as my trauma. So it, it comes naturally to me um, to tell these difficult stories, not just from myself, but they're common stories. I'm not unique. So when people read the book or when they hear me speak about my experiences of trauma, they're like, me too, you know, just like the movement. There's so many untold stories out there and there's still so many levels of relatedness. And so through um, plays, through, I'm also an improv, a professional improver. I do something called playback theater. So community members tell their stories and we act them out spontaneously on stage after they share their stories. And what I love about having that muscle is that I can navigate almost anything. So when Shimani passed, I was devastated, of course. I was deeply hurt, wounded. My grief was huge. But because I had been practice, practicing being able to receive information, sometimes very traumatic information, and pivot and generate from that space and cry and laugh and do all the things because I've done it on stage in so many different ways and off, um, I was able to move more um, fluidly and fluently through my pain and my suffering and then help others in my, my family to do it as well and also in the larger community. And so um, when I think about singing and when I think about anything that involves word and word play, there's so much possibility there. And my, my mantra is that words and wounds create worlds. And they do, and they can create worlds of healing and transformation. They can create a space of acceptance. They can create a space of um, restoration and forgiveness and restorative outcomes for people. And just like your participation, which we haven't talked um, much about with the Mbongi, you know, the tribunal. Yeah, let's of talk other about it. Court. Let's let's talk about yeah, that. You know. Yeah, yeah. To give people some background, I, I feel like that's a nice natural transition. This is a this was a very hard event for me, but I'll I'll let you do your part first. <laughs> So um, I'm part of a national collective and so is Omari called Speak, Move, Change. And we came together in 2021 and we were brought together by myself and two other mothers who lost their daughters due to maternal mortality. Tragic losses, but we decided we wanted to work with one another and do something around Black Maternal Health Week, which happens in April. And so we started our first endeavor in 2021. And because I'm an artist and also I consider myself to be a scholar as well. And you know, those women um, collecting data, doing the analysis, researchers, all the things, um, and mothers above all, we decided to merge our gifts together and to do some Something unique. So we had seven days of offering in virtual space for people across the nation to honor um, their experiences around trauma, loss, grief, um, uh, inequities, disparities in um, maternal health for black and brown people. So the first year we did it, we had a panel discussion and they were like, oh, we need to be focusing on postpartum because that's when black and brown moms are most likely to die and indigenous um, mothers or birthing people. And we decided to do that. So last year we launched the National Postpartum Awareness Week for the very first time for black indigenous people of color. And 
This year was our second iteration of it. Now, what was this, um, suggested is that we do a mock trial to address what J. Marion Sims, the so-called father of gynecology, did to the mothers of gynecology, Betsy and Arca, Lucy, Louisa, Amanda, Julia, um, these mm -hmm. phenomenal women whose stories had not been told. Now, we do have a Betsy and Anarka Lucy day where they get recognized because history and the review demonstrated that what those white men, J. Marion Sims and his peers did, was atrocious. Um, however, we need to unpack what happened. So we used artificial intelligence. We used drama. We used music, movement. You were a part of it, and you played the part of J. Marion Sims, and we're so grateful for the courage <laughs> to do that. Um, and hold space. And you were amazing and people loved it and hated it at the same time too. Yeah. That's the story of my life. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no. So it was amazing how we were able to use all of these mechanisms through the innovation. Cause remember we said ARIA stands for the advancement of reproductive innovation through artistry and healing. So ritual, ceremony, artistry, all infused together using AI and these digital platforms to bring it to life. And we also use a system that was coined by, or word or concept that was coined by um, Octavia Butler, and that was Afrofuturism. Mm. So we merged past, present, and future and created a hearing where we heard what J. Marion Sims did from his mouth and the witnesses of the women who are now ancestors. But we envisioned what they went through and what they might have said. And then we brought that to life in real time and space. And we did it in an African-centered way using something called the Mbongi. And the response out of this world, Powerful. you know, and we're going to do more of that. And so art is universal and it's transformative. It's educational and it will help you to ascend if you allow for it. But these systems put art down here, very below everything else, when it can be a technology that can take you far and wide, even beyond what you learn from books and what you talk about in general conversation in the classroom and outside of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're you're. I, I think you're being very gracious with uh, um, um, my involvement. It, I, it was a very very small role that I played, but I had to prepare for 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 a while to do that. And even when I was doing it, Shawnee. I had to like channel a part of me that I didn't realize it was there, but it was there. I could, I could do it. Like I, it wasn't, it was pretending, but it was like, okay, let me muster up every little bit of, of, um, I don't know. Uh, what's the word? It's, it's sort of like, let me try to imagine what it was like to be this white man in, in the antebellum South. And did he really believe this? And I actually think he really did think he was a virtuous person trying to just shine. And um, and for those who don't know, J. Marion Sims is, as you mentioned, Shawnee, considered the father of gynecology. And when he was doing these operations on these women in the antebellum South, we did not have a profession of gynecology. So the reason he's given this title is because he was developing, he was innovating an in, in artistry of his own and it came at the cost of Betsy and Narca Lucy and probably many, many, many more women. Those are the three that we have. And by the way, J.C. Hallman is coming on the podcast. He'll be uh, a couple months after you. But he did. He's the um, filmmaker behind the Anarca Archive. We'll put a link in the in the podcast description. But when I saw myself on camera, I I hated myself. Like I was like, that is not a good guy. And um, and at the same time, why was it important? Like, why is it important for us collectively to, to go through these things? Why can't we just say, forget him and cut him out of the textbooks? Like, why is it actually healing to act that out? Because it did feel healing. It felt like almost like a, a breath of, like a sigh of relief. So why is that? Like, why does that happen? Like, like in, in this, this way of providing therapy to people? Yeah, um, I'm going to invite Omari into this space to talk about this too. Um, so I want to go roll back to what you said. I'm being gracious. You also said something about me that is very true about me and anybody who knows me. Like I am, I'm an authentic person. I'm a straight shooter. Um, you know, what folks need to know is that we worked with you on the part. Yeah. And so because you came in with like, you know, 
having this pensiveness about it and not wanting to be viewed as him. And I'm like, Jasmine, you know, my daughter, who was also part of the process of, um, you know, manifesting the Mbongi and working with you, um, we wanted to make sure that we coached you so that you can bring it, not for you, not, not, not making it about how good you were, but also, but making it about how necessary you needed to be, be as authentic and grounded in the part right. so that the folks who are the, on the other side of those atrocities can receive some level of truth telling and healing for themselves. So you are a service to the community and boy, oh boy, was it of service. So much so that folks were like, actually I see his humanity even through the cruelty and the egoic way in which he operated and the arrogance in those times, because how I view it is like he felt so low and felt like he had to prove himself so much that he stripped himself of his humanity yeah. so that he could look good for this external force that didn't give a shit about him, yeah. really. Yeah. Um, you know, it's about what you can produce and trying to be this man and demonstrate that he was better than, and that's the the, the insidiousness and the toxicity of white supremacy, prim, white supremacy culture. I'll say this really quickly. J. Marion Sims lives in me, right? White supremacy lives in me. I've been indoctrinated with it since I was pre-verbal. And so I'm always checking myself around how I listen, Ooh. how I treat people, my ego, because whiteness lives in black people <laughs> because it just is the, the the nature of this as dr livingston who was also part of the mbongi says this cake that has been baked that is hard to unbake so amari anything you want to add to this piece uh yeah just really the um the only thing that i can really think of the first thing that came to mind you know when the, you asked the question was our you know just really genetic makeup you know and, and how you know we really Sometimes I feel like a lot of people you know, think that they're just here. Like it was their mom and their pop made them and then now they're just here, you know? And they don't understand and realize how much we carry, you know? I, from, um, I created a, a piece, you know, and in the piece I wrote that, you know, there's 130,000, there's 130,000 people that created you from essentially 1916 to now. Right. So that's that we and we have all that DNA, all that trauma, all that grief. All, and it, and like Shawnee said, this is a cake. Right. So I'm not just made of, of a black person like I've got white and Indian and all the everything in between. Right. And because of the fact because of that fact, the way we really start to really go deep into our own emotional state and our own spiritual states and, and all those things come up, you know, it comes up from all the things that my mother and my father, my great grandmother, my great, 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 great had to deal with it and, um, and um, be a part of, you know? So yeah. when we start to really use art and again, art is probably the oldest technology, right? It's probably the first and what makes human beings, human beings. It makes us who we are, you know? So when we start using art in that way, you know, you're going to bring up a lot, a lot of stuff. Oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, all, all our ancestors have been connected in some way, shape, or form to art. Yeah, there was something really, uh, a, a, Shawnee, in some regards, the fact that we had gone to South Africa and we had done so many ceremonies around calling in our ancestors, um, that actually, I think, was a prerequisite for me to appreciating just how important that Mbongi event was and playing that role, um, which is why I think it, I talked to my wife and I, I told you, Shawnee, I said, um, you know, I've got these apprehensions because people like to get upset about things and I don't want to be the poster child for the, uh, the, the crowd that is upset about the truths or whatever's coming up in them when they see this event. Um, and so my wife was like, just be sure, you know, you might get a lot of flack for this. And I told you about that. And while I was telling you, I said, you know, now that I'm saying it out loud, it almost feels like I can actually heal from this instead of ignoring it. I can actually, let me embody this guy. Let me see what it was really like to feel like him. And when I was watching myself on the screen, I was like, oh my God, that is J. Marion Sims. And I really believed what I was saying. And so it actually helps me for better or for worse, have a little bit of compassion in stripping him of that title and then handing that title over to who actually, I think, 
if anybody, you know, um, should be adorned with the title of a mother or father of gynecology, it should be these women. That's, um, of course, if any, everybody wants the details of that, we'll put, you know, some links to the event that they can go and watch it for themselves whenever you figure out how you're going to launch it to the public. But also, you know, J.C. Hallman's work, um, who's a Southern white guy who actually really took a, a, a really, um, a really deep dive into some of the, um, the more, I don't know, the sort of the archives in, in the Southern libraries and the, you know, where I don't even know. I mean, the guy did so much research on it in order to really clarify who were these women and let's tell their story. You know, let's not maybe f totally forget. We can maybe try to forgive. I don't know, but let's also, let's also elaborate on the story of these women who really did, uh, re they experienced quite a bit of suffering at the hands and of, of, of not just Sims, but a lot of other men at the time, um, who were trying to make their name in surgery. So, um, so thanks again, in retrospect, thanks for the opportunity to do that. I actually think I needed you to nudge me and I, I really appreciated that from you. Um, Guys, we have been recording now for some time. Um, I want to just take one final opportunity for you guys to share anything else that comes to mind. And of course, maybe just share, you know, you're going to be coming out to Louisville for this Born Free Twins Breach Conference. And I'd like to know what you guys are hoping to provide the attendees with um, and what you're hoping to maybe um, be able to learn from this event yourself. It's August 8th through the 11th, and you're both going to be there on a panel um, around the, the film that we've been talking about, Aftershock. Um, maybe just like go, go inward and just tell me what, what you're thinking about whenever this event is, you know, as this event is approaching. Yeah, so I'll jump in and say that, um, you know, um, once again, this word thing, so born free as an opener for um, what we're going to experience. I really want that to be a reality for folks, um, but it's hard to get there. Um, so even if you're a new being coming into the world, this moment in time, I'm, people are giving birth all over the planet, um, but how can we be born free if we're unwilling to go back and fetch the things? There's something called Sankofa, right? Go back and fetch and get what was left behind, our stories, our humanity, like all of that, so that we can stand in this present moment powerfully and be truly free, whether we're birthing or otherwise, and then plan for a future. There's a thread between all of it. And so what yeah. I want to bring to the conference is that we will not be free until we reconcile and deal with what happened in the past and um, how it's impacted us. You know, we didn't get a chance to talk a lot about at all about weathering, but, you know, I'm 55, I can look younger, right? That's what people say. But internally, because of the burden of racism, I'm, my, my organs have aged, my heart, mm. my liver, my lungs. And so I, internally, I'm 10 years older. You know, and I take care of myself. It may not be true for me, but it's true for many folks that weathering as a reality, sure. a concept that they study is a reality for us. And I want us to be free of that so that we can live harmonious and powerful lives. So I look forward to being in that space, co-creating that with you, Omari, and all of the other folks that will gather. Thank you, Shawnee. Omari, any, anything else coming up for you? Uh, yeah, so what comes up for me is, you know, Shawnee and I have had opportunities to, you know, go around the country and, you know, share our story and, and um, you know, talk about the things that we're doing, but we've, I don't know if shorty has been, I've never been to Kentucky before um, <laughs> and, I, and I've never um, spoke, you know, there. So, and I, I'm very cognizant of where I'm at, you know, so like I'm in New York and also very cognizant of the numbers, right? So I'm in New York um, and all the mid, a lot, uh, not all, a lot of the midwives and doulas and, and workers who are in the maternal health space here that I know are black women black and brown women, you know, but I also know that, you know, if we're looking at this on a, you know, uh, um, um, uh, not international, you know, on a national scope, you know, I, I think the numbers are like two to, to 5%, you know, of midwives and doulas being black and brown. Uh, so coming to a space where there are implicit bias, you know, even though we're all doing the work, you know, and are ingrained in the work, but the fact that there's implicit 
bias, the fact that we all come from different backgrounds, even though we are wanting to hold, we want to achieve the same goals, right? Yeah. But being able to really have conversations and be entrenched and involved with people who don't necessarily look like me, who don't necessarily look like Shawnee, who have a different perspective, you know, who have a different mindset, who've been taught different things, you know, about themselves, about us, you know, like it's like, and really having an, a chance to um, create space for different conversations to happen, for different, you know, connections to, to be created is super important for me. And I'm really looking forward to it from um, a perspective of me share and us sharing our experiences, but also taking other people's experiences as well, because that's it's also very important. You know, if we're really talking about shifting and creating culture and and, and creating change, you know, it is a, a um, is there has to be reciprocity involved in it? Yeah. You know, intentional yeah. reciprocity. You know, so I'm looking forward to that. Me too, guys. Thank you so much um, again for giving me some of your 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 very very limited time these days. I am so appreciative of the work you're doing. I I I will sincerely feel like we're friends when we can. Omar, you and I can meet for the first time in person, and Shawnee, we can reconnect. Um, of course, I feel like we're friends, but it's nowadays it is it really means a lot when you get to be with a person in their space, and um, and I, I feel very fortunate the, to have you guys out. So. Um, thanks again for today. We'll see you, you know, I, I misspoke earlier. This is going to be coming out in July. So it, it's roughly a month or so, um, when you hear this, uh, that we're going to be seeing each other, but, um, I wish you both, um, a happy week, happy weekend. And, um, if you of course ever need anything from me or the born free community, we've got you in, in any way that we can. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Nate. You're very welcome. Looking forward to August. Yeah, we'll see. It's going to be hot and humid here, so <laughs> back appropriately. Gotcha.